together. I want to talk about synthesis. And probably the best example that I can find of cultural synthesis or cultural renaissance, especially in American history, is of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, I, like, I love talking about the Harlem Renaissance. Now, you all remember everything about the Harlem Renaissance, right? You all know all about it. You know everything about it. You could give me a timeline of the Harlem Renaissance because we, we all learned it in school, right? Yeah. We spent like a day on it in high school. Maybe a paragraph on the history books, if you're lucky. Um, for those of you who are um, a little rusty on your American history, Harlem Renaissance, uh, can anyone tell me when the Harlem Renaissance happened? Do we even know that? No? 1960s? <laughs> 1960s? Not quite. Not quite. Any other guesses? 70s? No. Getting colder, actually. <laughs> what? The 1920s. It was the 1920s. So almost 100 years ago. Right? 1920s in Harlem, New York. Before the 1920s rolled around, uh, African Americans, uh, you know, they were released from slavery in 1865, right? So then there was uh, 45 years up until the turn of the century, and then another 10, 20 years on top of that. So like 50, 60 years where African Americans, um, you know, were trying to find themselves. Having been released from hundreds of years of slavery and being sort of owned as objects. Now they were free. They were uh, legally recognized as, as, as people. And this was a big change. And African Americans were sort of asking themselves the same exact questions that Asian Americans ask, we ask ourselves today. So you know those questions that we ask ourselves, who am I? Uh, what's my identity? Where do I fit in? Am I Asian? Am I American? All this stuff. African Americans were asking themselves the very same questions a hundred years ago. Who am I? Where do I fit in this country? Am I African? Am I American? Am I white? Am I black? What does it mean to be African American? What does it mean to be black? I have no idea. Should I straighten my hair? Should I leave it, leave it as it is? So what clothes should I wear? How should I talk? How should I act? How should I? They had no idea, right? I mean, there was some, there was some culture that they had held on to very, very tight uh, over the hundreds of years. But they wanted to know who they were now, who they were in this modern, modern age back then, right? And then the 1920s rolled, rolled along, and I want to emphasize something. It was artists, not politicians, not activists. It was artists who gathered in Harlem, New York, and said, hey, enough of this wondering who we are and asking other people who we are. Enough of that. We're going to go out there and we're going to tell ourselves who we are. We're going to tell our people who we are. We're going to be the ones to decide what our identity is, how we should wear our hair, how we should dress, what music we should listen to. We're going to decide it. We're no longer going to look to, to white people and follow them and copy them and dress the way they dress, and do, talk the way they talk, we're going to find out what it is to be Asian, to be African American. And, then I, right? and so in Harlem, New York, you have musicians, poets, right? you've got dancers, you've got singers, you've got all of these creative people getting together. Again, artists, not politicians, getting together in Harlem, New York, and just having fun, getting down with each other, collaborating, right? creating, creating new things new poetry, new literature, right? new dance, new music, and it exploded. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to be a part of it. That was the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. A lot of things were created in the Harlem Renaissance, and they continue today. Um, this is just sort of a really quick, I'm giving you like a really, in a nutshell, history of, the, of, the, of African American history in the 20th century. But, if you look at the music that came out of the Harlem Renaissance, now this is all debatable, of course, but if you look at it turned into doo-wop and rock and roll in the 50s, right? And then rock and roll and, and uh, turned into funk, right? Funk turns into hip-hop, right? Hip-hop turns into God knows what it is today. I don't even know. It's changing so fast and it changes and it changes, but it is all still traceable back to the Harlem Renaissance when African Americans said, you know what? We're going to make, we're going to decide who we are. And it is, continues today, and African Americans continue to draw an extreme source of pride from these, these cultural inventions. Uh, whether or not, again, it, whether or not African Americans even like this stuff. You know, like they may not even, you, you, as an African American, you may not even like hip hop and R&B. You may hate this stuff. You, it may drive you crazy. But you recognize that it is of the African American community, right? This could even be done with all cultural forms, all art, art forms. Music, dance, poetry, literature. This is just an example of the dance styles, the evolution of dance that happened 
uh, throughout the generations, right? Um, now, I argue that in the 1960s and 70s, Asian Americans had the beginnings of our own cultural renaissance. Stuff was happening. Things were going down. Things were being created. It was very exciting times. Uh, a lot of stuff in San Francisco, Los Angeles, new, um, you know, new theater, new plays were being written. Uh, music was being made. You know, paintings were being done. Uh, festivals were being started. You know, movies were being made. Uh, you know, stars were being born. Uh, and it was the beginnings of a new artistic movement for Asian Americans. And again, I think this was the movement that laid that foundation. But I, I sort of sat down at my desk the other day and I asked myself, okay, well that's what they had in the 70s. What do we have now for us, for our generation, right? I still consider myself as part of your generation, okay? I'm not too old. What do we, ha we, what do we have um, uh, for our generation as, as Asian Americans? What do we have that we can point to and say that is Asian American? That belongs to us. This is our form of whatever, whatever. What do we have? I asked myself, and I wrote down a few things. Um, I made a list. Okay, this is mainly a joke. This is sort of a joke slide. Uh, I tried to think of all the things that were sort of unique to Asian Americans, like and Asian Americans only. Like we were the only ones that really sort of understood these things or um, could lay claim to these things. No one else in the country could lay claim to these things, right? So, for example, um, uh, bubble tea, right? So bubble tea, you know, who here, does everybody know what bubble tea is? Yeah, okay. Um, that's something that Asian Americans, we freaking love it. I mean, we, and we love it more than Asian people in Asia. I mean, they invented this stuff, but we love it more than they love it. Because you go to Asia, you go to Asia, you go to, um, you know, any place in Asia, and they'll be like, yeah, we got bubble tea, but it's cool, it's whatever. We got all these other drinks, too. And, but Asian Americans are like, no, I want, I want some bubble tea. Give me some bubble tea. I gotta have my bubble tea. In fact, even, and even me, like, when I landed in Florida yesterday, I was like, Think in my head, where's the nearest bubble tea place? And I know some of you are thinking about it right now, too. You're thinking, oh man, I could really use some bubble tea right now. That'll get me through this whole workshop. Um, this is mainly a joke. But these, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's things that, there's, there's these, these sort of, these things here and there that we can sort of say, hey, that's, that's ours. We understand that more than anybody else, or we love it more than anybody else, or we connect with it more than anybody else. Whether or not you like it, obviously, like rice rockets. I never had a rice rocket. Does everybody know what a rice rocket is? Okay, it's when, it's when Asian American guys uh, buy import cars and they pour thousands of dollars into them and soup them up and put all types of illegal additions to it um, that makes the cars not necessarily street legal. Um, big fins that make them look like they're out from outer space, you know what I mean? Um, I hated that shit. Oh, excuse my language, too. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I might let a little few of those fly tonight. Uh, I hated it. I hated rice rockets. You know what I mean? I, rice rockets, the, and the, the guys who did that, they drove me crazy. They drove me absolutely crazy. I was like, that is so dumb. You're wasting so much money and so much time, like, souping up these cars for no reason. You can't even drive them on the street because they're so low, you can't go over a speed bump. And it's like, why are you doing this, right? <laughs> And no, but even though I hated it, I had to recognize that, you know, Asian Americans, like, that was our thing. You know what I mean? Like, we did that in a very specific way, right? We do it in a very unique way, even. We, we, we look at, we go after very unique cars, very specific cars, right? Uh, Latino Americans do this as well, but they use very different cars, right? We like Hondas and Toyotas and that, st that type of stuff, but they, they like, you know, like trucks and, and different things. So it's like, it's different. It's very, very different and very unique, and I had to recognize that as an Asian American thing. Like, you know, I can't get away from it, you know, <laughs> as much, as hard as I try. Um, but, so the, the point being that there wasn't a lot that I could point to. Uh, there weren't, weren't a lot of things, there are some things, right? Um, but there wasn't a lot that I could point to that I could say that is Asian American and nobody else gets it. But I ask you here tonight, and this has a lot to do with media, what if there were more? What if there were more things up on that board? What if there were so many things that we couldn't even count them? What if there were things up on that board that 
you know, in every aspect of life, right? Remember culture, it's everything. What if every aspect of the way you live your life, there was something where you could say there's an Asian American way of doing that. There's an Asian American way of saying hello that nobody else does or nobody else does it right, right? Not even in Asia or in America, anywhere. What if there was a way? What if there was um, a style of food that only Asian Americans you know, ate or did very well, right? I mean, bubble tea is kind of a step in that direction, right? If you look at who here has been to Hawaii? Anybody been to Hawaii? No? Yeah? Okay. Awesome, a few people. So you might have been able to tell that in Hawaii, there's a lot of Asian folk there, a lot of Asian folks, um, and there's so many, in fact, and they've been there for so long that they have created, they've done this, a lot of this, actually. They've done it. They're way ahead of us on the mainland. In Hawaii, they have their own way of greeting each other. They have their own uh, hand signals. They have their own uh, forms of communicating, their own dialect, their own slang. They've got their own food, right? It's food that is unique to Hawaii. You can't find it anywhere else in the world but in Hawaii, and nobody else does it the way they do it. Have you ever heard of Spam Musubi? Some of you have. Okay. So you all know what Spam is, right? Yes. Some of you have varying, degree, varying degrees of responses to, to it. Positive, <laughs> negative. We all know what Spam is. Musubi is when you take rice and you take seaweed and you wrap something in it. Spam Musubi is you take those two things, you wrap the Spam and the rice and the seaweed, and you put some teriyaki sauce on it. And it's something that no one else in the world does. No one else in the world loves the way they love it. Uh, but they do, you know what I mean? And it's, it's theirs. It is theirs. You can't take it away from them. You can't say, oh, no, no, we invented that in California. Or, oh, no, no, we, we love it more than you do in France. No, you, the Hawaiians, you know, they, they've got it. Um, even people in Asia, uh, even people in in our cousins over there in Asia, in Asia proper, right? They, they're doing this too. They do the same thing. They take their culture, their traditional culture, right? They add new things to it, they change it around a little bit, and they create something completely and utterly new. But at the same time, it is still sort of traceable to what came before. Uh, for example, uh, you know, just like pop culture, anything pop culture, music videos, movies, right? You watch Bollywood, anybody seen a Bollywood movie before? Right? That is distinctly Indian and is distinctly modern. Right? You can't say a Bollywood movie is like traditional, traditional. Right? Because it's all modern. They're doing modern stuff. They're doing cool things. They're doing they're wearing crazy clothes. They're like driving fancy cars and stuff like that. But it's it's a modern um, evolution of their traditional culture. Right? Um, but what are we doing? What are we doing here in America as Asian Americans? What are we doing? They're doing all this cool stuff. What are we doing? Um, we have been given the same traditions, the same culture that they get over there, that these people get over there, right? We get the same stuff. We are imbued with the same uh, uh, traditions. We, we have the same blood running through our veins, right? What are we doing? How come we're not taking all that traditional stuff, making it new, and creating something completely different? Hmm? Um, Let's think about that. And let's talk about media. So this workshop is about media. It's about pop culture. It's about uh, our represent the representation of ourselves. And media is very important because, uh, because of this little diagram here. Media is fantasy on the right side of this diagram.